Good evening, and welcome to the first lecture in the 2022 Exploring Space Lecture. My name is Matt Chandel, and I'm the Curator of Planetary Science at the National Air and Space Museum. And it's a pleasure to see you here in person, and for those of you joining us remotely, it's a pleasure to be seen. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us. The theme for this year's series is Eyes on Earth. The uh, four lectures we present over the next months explore how access to space hasn't just allowed us to look outward and learn more about stars and other planets, but has also given us new tools and a new vantage point from which to learn about our home here on Earth and the complex and interacting systems that make it a habitable world. The 2022 Exploring Space Lecture Series will highlight work being done in space today to better understand our shared history with our planet, with remote sensing, human observation, and exoplanet science searching for new Earth. As in previous years, this series is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, United Launch Alliance and Aerojet Rocket. And this year, while we continue the project to revitalize and transform the National Air and Space Museum on the National Mall, we are fortunate to be able to hold this series in the Rasmussen Auditorium at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I want to thank our colleagues here at this museum for allowing us to use their beautiful space. Tonight, our speaker is Dr. Krista peters Ladard, the Deputy Director of the Sciences and Explorations Directorate at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. peters Ladard graduated summa cum laude from Virginia Tech, earned her doctorate at Princeton University, and has since worked at NASA since 2001. Her talk this evening is titled, NASA's Earth Information System, Open and Accessible Science to, to Improve Life on Earth. Dr. Peters Ladard will share with us tonight how NASA's new Earth Information System delivers analysis-ready products for use by scientists and non-scientists alike, and will provide an overview of EIS's three pilot studies, EIS Fire, Freshwater, and sea level change. Now, um, if I could divert a bit into ancient history, and I mean literally into ancient history, um, to Plato. So in Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, Socrates, who is still philosophizing while awaiting his imminent execution, uh, proposed the hypothetical experience of being able to fly like a bird to the top of the atmosphere and to see the word, world from above. He compared it to that of a fish who has spent their entire life at the bottom of the sea, thinking they know the world, swimming to the top of the water, and poking their head out to see just how limited their perspective actually is. Now, Socrates uh, didn't really understand space the way we do today, and he certainly didn't foresee satellites, uh, but he nonetheless proposed that if we could see the world from above, we would see how its parts are connected the arid deserts, the prairies, the farmlands, the volcanoes, the seas, and the rivers that flowed into them. Well, we've had our heads above the water for quite a while now, ever since the beginning of the space, and I know we all want to be enlightened, enlightened by that perspective. So let's welcome Dr. Peters Ladard to the podium to tell us about NASA's Earth Information System and how the data it produces is making life better for us on Earth today. Thank you very much. And, you know, given the venue uh, in this beautiful museum of the American Indian, it is appropriate to acknowledge uh, the, the land upon which we are um, speaking this evening. Um, so Washington, D.C. actually sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans um, and the neighboring Piscataway and Pamunkey people. And we would like to acknowledge and recognize and honor their contributions and their, their role in our lives today. So as Matt introduced me, you know, I'm, I'm Krista peters Ladard. I am at NASA Goddard. And one of the things that I want you to remember take away from 
today's presentation is that NASA does earth science. <laughs> so that's the first takeaway. Uh, you know, you're familiar with NASA and our mission. We explore the unknown in air and space. We innovate for the benefit of humanity, and we inspire the world through discovery. And, you know, when I came to Goddard many years ago, uh, I came to the Hydrological Sciences Lab. My background is in water resources, and I cared a lot about, you know, understanding the future of our planet and about the future of water on our planet. Um, and as I, you know, moved up at Goddard and started to think more broadly about Earth and about information on Earth, one of the most critical needs that I saw was that our data needed to be open and accessible to make it useful for improving life on Earth. And that is the mission of the Earth Information System. So, you know, a, another story that I want to mention is I'm from you know, Richmond, Virginia originally, and every year we, our, our family would travel to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And eventually, over 20 years ago, my parents bought a house in North Myrtle Beach. And over the years, we noticed that flooding was starting to happen more frequently. You know, tidal flooding, you know, this was not due to major hurricanes or, I mean, they, did, they were impacted by tropical storms, but this was just regular tidal flooding on sunny days. And Myrtle Beach is not the only place where this is happening. This is happening in Miami and Annapolis, Maryland. And you see these beautiful sunny days with inundation, nuisance flooding. And when we think about the information that you need to understand why this is happening. And, and my parents are making decisions about whether to sell their house and to buy a new house based on whether there's going to be flooding. And so this is the kind of information that we can bring to the public to use our satellite data for good and to understand the decisions that everyone is trying to make in the face of a changing planet. So NASA has been observing sea level since the 90s. And this graph, it, 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 it shows our, all of the satellites that we've had launched with our partners at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. You know, since the 90s to, the, to present uh, with partners in Europe and, and beyond where we have future missions planned. And one of the things we've learned over that time is that we know sea level has risen. This is a graph showing sea level change from the 90s to the present. And it's risen about three and a half inches on average over the whole globe. But the ocean is not a bathtub. And this is something that we've learned through our satellites. The ocean height and the change in the ocean height varies depending on where you are. The colors here, the red is 15 centimeters. So you've seen increases of up to 15 centimeters in the red areas. And in some areas, you see the little blue spots? There's actually been decreases in sea level. It depends on the, the ocean uh, topography and other things. So we can bring all of our data to help understand when and where sea level has risen and to use it in our models to project where sea level will continue to rise. So we look at the oceans, we look not just at the sea level, but we look at things like ice on the surface of the ocean or what we call sea ice. And what you see in this graphic is a time series of sea ice over the Arctic. And sea ice, as you may, may or may not know, shrinks and uh, grows with the seasons. Okay, so in the winter, sea ice gets larger, and in the summer, sea ice shrinks as it gets warm. But what's happening is we like to look at the minimum every year in the summer, and we like to see how that is trending over time. And what this is showing you from our satellite data is that since the late 70s to present, 
that minimum sea ice, the summer sea ice, has been going way down. And what's happening now is that there are places in the Arctic now that might be navigable in the summer. This is, this is, this is a new situation. And the other thing that you might notice is that as sea ice shrinks, you know, so you see, look at this figure. Sea ice is white, right? So white reflects heat or energy. The dark areas that are not covered by sea ice absorb more energy. And so, in fact, they warm up more. And so this becomes a positive feedback in the system. So NASA Goddard has worked for many years. We have a climate center located in New York City known as the Goddard Institute for Space Study. And they track the global temperatures using lots of different data. And what you're going to see now is an animation of the temperature changes over time from the time we started keeping records to the present. And what I want you to notice is the warm colors, and you can see there's a color bar up in the corner here. Fahrenheit is 3.6 is red, or Celsius is 2 degrees, if you like to think in metric units. Um, and what you'll see is over time, and the dates are up here, you see more red, especially in the Arctic, and especially over land. And so this is from observations. We know that temperatures are warming. And we can observe all of this from our observation system. So when we think about things that impact people and how this temperature impacts people, temperature changes impact people, well, in addition to sea level changing, some of you might be concerned about crops or about flowers, right? You might want to plant drought-resistant flowers or flowers that, are, that uh, heat, tolerate heat. So we actually have models that take the projected temperature and they simulate the impact on crops. And so what I'm going to show you now are historical period and then projections into the future for maize, which is corn, or wheat. And you're going to see how they change over time. And keep in mind that red means the red is minus 40% and green is plus 40%. And this is yield. So this is how much yield you expect to change. And as you go through time, what you will start to see, especially as we move into the future times, that the maze starts to go down. And that is because the type of photosynthesis that maize plants uh, use is more sensitive to heat. Whereas for wheat, which you can see up, up here, it's a positive change. So in fact, what this might tell you is as the climate warms and we see the changes all the way out to 2099, that crops in the Midwest, like corn, might need to be reconsidered. Maybe some more heat tolerant uh, varieties would be appropriate. Or wheat might actually be a, a better. Uh, strategy for the future based on what we expect to happen. So there's a lot of information here. And we're NASA, right? So one of the things we do is we explore the Earth from space. That is what this seminar series is about. And the way we explore Earth from space in the Earth sciences is by launching our satellites and using that satellite data to produce information, and which is really the foundation of this Earth information system. So this is an animation of all of our NASA satellites currently orbiting Earth. This is, we call this our fleet. And you can see there are dozens of satellites that are measuring all sorts of things. And I'm going to show you data from a lot of these tonight. So get ready. But I think the most important thing to take away is that this, these satellites collect a lot of data. And we want to make sense of that data to make it easy for you to use. So this is an example of what it looks like when those satellites pass over an area. And you see how as they, as they pass over an area, you get those purple swaths, which are just grids full of data that are continuously being collected. 
You also see data from many other sources. We've got surface stations, like weather stations, like the Weather Service has. You've even got these yellow streaks, which are from aircraft. And all of that data needs to be put together to create information that is useful for the future. All right, final point about data and the volume of data. We have a lot of data, and it is growing fast. So this chart shows NASA's data holdings in petabytes. Petabytes are 10 to the 15th bytes. And this is starting in 2015, and it's projecting out to 2025. And just for reference, the Library of Congress, the holdings, the entire set of holdings of the Library of Congress is about 20 petabytes. Well, we passed that in about 2017. And we're now looking at, by 2025, around 250 petabytes, just NASA data alone. So now you add to that our partner data from NOAA and uh, other international uh, partners. And then you add to that commercial data. And that's really the revolution in our science right now. This is going to show you what you can do with commercial data. You can actually do amazing science with commercial data. This is from Maxar's Digital Globe product. And you're going to zoom in to an area in Africa, in the Sahel region, where we actually used the data from the Digital Globe along with some machine learning on a supercomputer, and we counted individual trees. You can actually count trees with, our, with these data sets. And when you do that, you learn that there are way more trees than we thought, number one. But this is revolutionary, because now we've got the climate system. We understand what's happening at the large scale. We've got continuous coverage from different partner satellites that we can put together. And you can make, now you can bring it down to the scale of a tree or a neighborhood or a street. And that is the real revolution in information. So what is the Earth information system and why is NASA building it? We want to make information from our fleet that you saw before translated into products that can ultimately fit in the palm of your hand. I mean, you may not know this, but when you, when you use a navigation tool, to, like a mapping tool to get to the Smithsonian, the GPS satellites, the Global Positioning System satellites, are supported by NASA. And a lot of the background work that we do to map the uh, basically the uh, what is called the, the terrestrial reference frame. We actually map the Earth so that you know exactly where you are from that network, OK? And in the same way, we want to map where is the water, where are the fires, what is happening with sea level, where are the trees. All of these things ultimately matter to the future of Earth and our planet and humanity on this planet. So there's a little teaser. We'll get back to it. But that's our website. So if you want to check it out, you know. But wait till, you know, maybe I'm done. But, you know, check it out. <laughs> but what I'm going to tell you about are three pilot projects that we did in the first year of the Earth Information System projects. Freshwater, sea level change, and fire. All of these things you've heard a lot about in the news. We're, we're worried about flooding. We're worried about sea level rise, fires in the West. We're worried about all of these things. And people are asking questions. And we have the data, and we have the models and tools to help answer some of those questions. So let's get to the sea level first. So the sea level change information system, um, I want to acknowledge you know, all of the team members. They're listed here. Um, and this is a large inter-center effort. So let me also say, for the record, that this is a NASA-wide effort. This involves other NASA centers, including JPL, Ames, Marshall, and others. And when we worry about sea level, 
One of the things that really matters for sea level rise are ice sheets. So if you look at sea level rise, this is the same thing I showed you earlier, right? So it had about that, you know, it had that um, rise in, in sea level that I mentioned before. And the total sea level is here in purple, which is basically from two parts. Water that's melting and running off of the ice sheets and expansion when the, when the oceans heat up, they expand. So there's two pieces that are the main, explain, the main explanations for sea level rise. And we have to measure both of those things. And so when we do that, we actually notice from our observations that Greenland and Antarctica account for most of the variation and the acceleration in global mean sea level. And so how do we actually measure that? So I showed you sea ice, but that's not the same thing as ice sheets, right? So ice sheets can be measured in two different ways. You can measure the height of the ice sheet, or you can measure the mass of the ice sheet. And the mass of the ice sheet is something that we measure using a, a, a set of satellites called GRACE and GRACE follow-on. And this is just an amazing technology. They, these satellites measure gravity and changes in the gravitational field of the Earth, right? So just that alone is kind of like mind-blowing, right? And then they basically can tell you, based on changes in the gravity, how much mass is underneath the satellites as they pass over. And we can map how it changes over time. So when you do that, you're, you're like, wait, you have a scale for ice sheets. So what you're going to see in this animation is that over time, and this is from 2002 when the first GRACE was launched to present, you can see how the mass in Greenland in particular is going way down. That's the yellow. And in blue is the Antarctic ice sheet, both going down, right? So what happens when the mass is going down, that means it's melting. And that means the water is going into the ocean which is the contributor to sea level rise. So, so understanding this is really important for predicting the future. And one of the things we've found is that not only can we tell you the total mass, but we can actually map where the mass is changing the most. And so these red, these red uh, areas are where the most, the largest ice mass losses are occurring around the edges of the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets. And it turns out, and this is what the Earth Information System team is working on, so in order to understand that, you have to understand how ice sheets get built. And I didn't really know this you know, until I started working on this project, that the key is in something called the fern area, the fern layer. Okay, so a, the fern is basically compacted snow that's turning into an ice sheet. So it's that layer in between. So it's like a sandwich, okay? So you've got snow on the top, then the fern, then the ice sheet, okay? And that fern is really where all the action is happening, right? So things can maybe not melt more quickly. Water can flow down and accelerate the melt. That process, understanding that is really critical, and we have observations that help us understand what's happening. And we have a model that translates the observations into understanding. So we put the models together with information about the atmosphere and other things, like how much is it precipitating and other things. And we have other observations as well, uh, which is the other way we, we measure ice sheets, which is um, lasers. So we actually aim LIDAR lasers at the ice, and we measure its height. So we can track how it's, what the height is, and we can track how much it weighs using GRACE, and those two things together tell you a lot about what's happening inside the ice sheet. And that is what the Earth Information System is doing. It's putting all of those things together. So now we know why and how fast ice is melting and ultimately contributing to sea level. And getting back to you know, the dilemma my parents are facing, we have a tool now that actually helps you project sea level over time. And this tool is developed in cooperation with our colleagues at NOAA. 
And if you look at this tool, you know, like, remember, it's not a bathtub, so it varies by space. And you can zoom in to this tool and look at certain cities and ask what is going to happen in that city to sea level in the future. And it turns out, if you pick Charleston, South Carolina, for example, you know, what you see is that by 20, 2100, it's a meter of sea level rise projected on average. You can see there's a range because there's some uncertainty, but that's what we think will happen. So putting all of this together is what will help folks make decisions about what they do in the future. And that is one of the goals of the Earth Information System sea level change team. All right, switching gears, I'm going to talk now about freshwater. Right? That was our second pilot project, near and dear to my heart as a hydrologist. Uh, so again, I want to acknowledge um, the leads on this project. They're all listed here. And again, what we really care about with freshwater, especially are extremes, right? Droughts and floods. I mean, those are the high impact water events. But more than that, it's about availability of fresh water for the, for the future. And, and if you really want to know about fresh water, the first thing you want to know about is how much it's going to rain. How much is it raining? How much has it rained in the past? And how much do we think it'll rain in the future? And so this is an example of the collaboration that we have where we stitch multiple satellites together through a program called the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. I have been a member of the science team on this mission for many years. And you can see we have partner satellites all through here. and we paste it all together. And when we do that, we come up with an amazing product that tells you how much rain is happening over the whole globe every 30 minutes on a 10 kilometer grid. It's really unprecedented. And even better is that this happens in real time. So look at the date on this. This is March 18th. 19th. This is just a few days ago. <laughs> okay, so what we're really able to do as the first step of an earth information system is put together knowledge about precipitation worldwide. And, that, and by precipitation, I should point out that we mean rainfall, which is what are in the, the uh, green through red colors, and also frozen precipitation, snowfall. So it's all accounted for in this product. But that's just the beginning, right? Because the freshwater information system is really interested in understanding the mechanisms that lead to extremes, either flooding or droughts. On the website, there's examples of all kinds of things. I'm only going to show you one example today, which is flooding. 2019 was a tough year in the Midwest. And here's why. They experienced incredibly heavy rainfall on top of a very heavy snowpack. So they had a lot of snow on the ground. It rained on the snow. It rapidly melted. They had record flooding, which led to super wet soil, which then delayed the planting and led to losses in their crop yields. So all of these cascading impacts were really important. And so putting all of this together, just like we did for sea level, right? We put all the pieces together. The freshwater team also put all these pieces together. So this is the, uh, a major rainfall event that our GPM mission that I just talked about captured. This is a zoom in, so you can just see what that data looks like. And I'm going to really focus your attention on Nebraska, because that's going to come back in a minute. Okay, And keep in mind you know, where the Great Lakes are for orientation. So this was the snow cover. So our satellites see where snow is on the ground, and we can see when there's no snow on the ground. And so this is a, a slider, which is part of our information system. It's one of, so we, use, we have a partnership in the Earth Information System um, with Esri, the makers of ArcGIS, and that, um, that software allows you to do something called a story map. So you can actually navigate through different um, different visually through some of these things. And when you look at this uh, example of a slider, 
So the blue is snow, and that's before the rain, okay? After the rain, you move the slider over, and you see it's like the snow is erased in that area, right? So that heavy rain melted all the snow. Okay, so after the snow melted, then we look at another one of our satellites, which is on, on the Terra platform, and it's a sensor called MODIS. MODIS is a real workhorse. Um, it's a moderate resolution sensor, which means it's about one kilometer, but it actually can see flooding. So again, this is a before picture in the slider, and now you're gonna see the after picture, and just look at where all the standing water is in this area. So when you put all these pieces of data together, you see the story of these cascading impacts of rain on snow to flooding, and ultimately, which I'm not gonna show you, but it is on the website, uh, changes in greenness and crops. So you can see all of that with our satellite. And when you run that through the models, it helps you understand what processes led to these losses and potentially how they might vary in the future. Okay, so let me get to the third piece. So we have some time for questions. And the third piece of the Earth Information System is our fire information system. So again, I wanna acknowledge the folks on this list, um, especially here, Alexei Shiklamanov, who is now the lead for EIS at Goddard. And he played a huge role first on fire and now in the overall system. So this, uh, you know, again, we want to understand and predict the impacts of extreme fires. And one of the things that you might not realize when you think about fires, because you mostly see it from the United States perspective, unless you happen to look at fires worldwide, I don't know how many folks in the room look at fire data, but fires happen everywhere on the globe. And until you look at a map like this, you don't realize, you know, you look at the U.S. and you see, yeah, the West has some fires, but wow, you know, look at Central America, look at Africa. I mean, Australia, some of these fires are, are huge. Um, and so the first thing that we do at NASA when we think about the Earth from space is our global perspective, right? So we have that global perspective, and that's important because we want to provide information about the whole planet. But we can also zoom in. And especially in 2021, you know, this was a very devastating fire year, especially in the western U.S., and this is starting in January. So this is before the main fire season. But one of the surprises, I think, is when you start to zoom in on the U.S., you realize fires aren't just a western thing. There's a ton of fire. I mean, this was a surprise to me. I don't know if any of you were like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. Uh, look at all the fires in the southeast and the Midwest. Like, they're... You know, there are some um, prescribed burns and things. So, I mean, we pick, up, we pick up all the fires, no matter whether they're wildfires or intentionally set fires for management purposes, managing forests. I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons fires happen, okay? But what you really see standing out right now is the West, right? In the fire season in the Western U.S., in the fall, in the summer and fall, right? So when that fuel gets dry, Thing, you know, you're more susceptible to fires. So one of the things that we do in the fire information system is, first of all, we want to look at the pre-fire environment. We want to understand what is the state of the fuel, what is the state of the moisture, and how might areas be potentially susceptible to fire. Then we look at the current state of fire. So we want to understand how intense is the fire? How hot is it? What, how, what is it emitting? And then ultimately, and this is what our stakeholders have told us, because we worked with stakeholders in the West, they want to know when the fire's burning, where is it going to go next? And what, where has it been? And what is the burned area? And what are the post-fire, potential post-fire impact? So if you look at this fire, and you see Lake Tahoe, for reference, up here, as this fire expands, I mean, every dot here is something that our satellites saw, okay? So we see, and by the way, this is in collaboration with NOAA and their VIR sensor. This is a really important collaboration with NOAA. So this, we can't do this by ourselves, right? But we are putting these data sets together 
to try to tell the story of these fires and to, to provide situational awareness and ultimately to understand the nature of fire and fire impacts. So the first step is understanding the burned area and how that, how that fire area evolves over time. And so these colors just indicate the date over here and the areas burned in square kilometers. So you can see how the fire grows and gets bigger and then over time it kind of levels out. Um, but beyond that, we want to know the downstream impact. So where there's fire, there's smoke. <laughs> and so this is one of the things that we're also tracking with our satellites. So the fire information system takes the VIRS fire detections along with other data. It actually computes the emissions from the fire, puts it into a model that then simulates how that smoke is lifted up into the atmosphere and transported downstream. So what you're looking at here, the white is the smoke, and you can see the fires. And it sort of pumps it out and moves to the east very clearly, right? There's other things here that are not fires. <laughs> There's sea, uh, sea salt aerosols, which are the blue. You can see hurricanes spinning up. And, and then you can see dust from the Sahara. So our satellites can actually see these aerosols. And then we integrate that with our models so that we understand how they're transported downstream and what the impacts might be. This is a huge concern for air quality, but also in general for just understanding how uh, you know, the impacts of fires and the interaction um, with precipitation and cloud processes. So that's it for the, the main parts of the Earth Information System, but I want to point out that NASA is working on the next generation of satellites right now. And that next generation of satellites is called the Earth System Observatory. We have an interconnected set of four missions that are going to measure, measure quantities that we care about and that will ultimately feed into this Earth information system. So we're measuring clouds, convection, precipitation, just like I showed you GPM. We're going to take it to the next level where we really understand the processes in clouds. We're going to understand aerosols and specifically different types of particles and how they interact with climate. We're going to understand mass changes. I showed you the scales that measure the ice sheets. These, uh, these scales measure more than ice sheets. They measure groundwater and other things. We're going to look at surface deformation and change, look, look at how um, surface biology and geology changes. And all of that will be integrated together as a constellation for the future. So when we, when we built the Earth Information System, we knew that this would be the foundation for the future of understanding the Earth and making sense of all of the data that we're collecting. Ultimately, we want to answer questions that you all care about. What is the current and projected sea level rise? How will sea level change coastlines? How is the water cycle changing, especially droughts and floods? And how, what are current and projected fires and, and their air quality impacts? So I invite you all to to check out our Earth Information System website. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Peters, Dr. Peters Ladard, for a wonderful talk. Um, we're going to be taking questions tonight from our online audience, but also from our in-person audience, so if you are in the audience here tonight and have a question, please uh, come and line up the microphone uh, where we will take your questions, and if you're online, continue to put your questions in the chat, and those will be then on this virtual device. So while we wait for folks in the audience to uh, get up and pose their question, I'm going to ask the first question from the audience, or excuse me, from the online audience. So Leanne asks, 
how do you know which of the measured mass actually ice what part others that's a great question so first of all we only measure the total so we have to combine the information about the mass change with our models to understand where the melt is occurring but what we know is that as we know for sure that the mass is going down so that means we must be uh, losing mass likely due to melt. really through that integration I mentioned the fern model i mentioned some of the, we have ice sheet models as well all of these pieces together help us put together the understanding of exactly what's happening uh, when we combine the mass change information with the height information that I also mentioned. So it's combining the data and the models that helps us understand what's happening. Um, while we wait for someone to uh, line up here, I want to go ahead and take uh, sort of the host's prerogative and ask you a question. So, you know, what you were just describing and also some of what you showed tonight, um, and you described as, you know, taking data, various data sets, transforming those into information, yes. and then uh, the next step of that seems to be, uh, maybe through some of the visuals that you provided, communicating that yes. information then to, to the public. Who do you see uh, as the end users of, of this data, and, and what types of decisions based on these, the information? Great. Yeah, yeah. That, I, we've thought a lot about this in the Earth Information System team. So we have stakeholders that have information need at very at, at different levels right so some stakeholders want to get in there and pull our data and our models and actually put them into their own system you know so they're very technologically advanced users who want to just who want to stick everything together and and, and use it um, you know in a pretty sophisticated way then you also have intermediate users that might want to know sort of summaries of the data. And they might want the summaries in a graphical form. They might want to have the ability to query. So one of the things we get like from the fire users in particular is they want to be able to get information that is location specific. And they want to be able to query the data by, by a, a specific uh, community or area of interest and and uh, think of it like you know a weather app on your phone i mean you might want a fire app you know where you could query nasa's data and see what it says and then ultimately you know there's um you the general public right so we you might want to have a tool um, and in fact we recently partnered with um first street foundation who uh, developed a tool called flood factor some of you might have seen this. It's actually in uh, some real estate websites, and I know my parents were looking at it. Um, so we actually will be providing our data to them, which then they might translate into a value-added product that is tailored for a specific purpose. Like, should I buy this house? Is it likely to experience flooding in the future, based on what we know? So behind the scenes, they will do some, you know, they may do their own proprietary integration, but we might just provide the data in a way that they can provide a visual interface on their own platform. So we want to, you know, you can imagine a spectrum of users that might want information delivered in different ways, in a visual way, in a, in a you know, I guess, you know, to geek out, you know, like in the cloud, you know, in a Jupyter Hub collaboration environment, <laughs> um, and everything in between. Great. I, I see we have some questions in the audience. Why don't you tell us who you are and what's your question? Sure. My name's James, uh, James Bussey. Um, I have two questions. First, I think is going to be really quick. Is GRACE, the gravitational systems, useful in tracking hydrobot? Theoretically, I guess this is groundwater is actually what they do. Okay, so the second is, and maybe this is more of NOAA's than NASA's kind of uh, area expertise there, but are there uh, systems in instrument that are in place or being planned for actually tracking salinity and um, uh, acidity of the actual oceanic that we're seeing as well that, that, that we're looking at. And what, what do those look like? What can we expect? Okay, 
Well, all right, great question. So first of all, grace. So grace, because it measures the total mass, um, over land, if you've got groundwater, especially if groundwater is changing, grace can actually tell you about whether groundwater is decreasing or increasing because it measures the total amount of water. I mean, if you look at a, a land mass, most of what's changing is the water, right? So it's, if it's an ice sheet, it's the water on top. If it's not an ice sheet, it's the water in the ground. So we have products that my colleague, Matt Rodell, produces, which actually tell you where the water is changing. Is it in the root zone? Is it in the groundwater? And we deliver those products to partners at NOAA and, and our, the US Drought Monitor, for example. So that's the first question. The second question is about salinity and ocean acidification and what are we going to see there? So first of all, we've had salinity products in the past. Passive microwave uh, sensors, uh, Aquarius and others have, have measured salinity. Um, so we know how to do that. And um, in the future, uh, we're, we will continue to have other sensors that measure salinity. Um, we're, I mean, just a little segue, we're also launching something to measure phytoplankton, uh, a satellite called PACE, which is even cooler because not only will we know salinity, we're going to know not only how much phytoplankton total is there, but which species of phytoplankton. It's going to be amazing. So that, I mean, you know, then you'll be able to know which fish food is there. <laughs> um, so that, you know, so I think ultimately the ocean chemistry will be resolved by models that take into account all of these pieces of data and then integrate all of that to understand the state of the ocean. Wow. Well, I'm going to uh, transition to another question from the online audience. Jorge asks, how do you normalize data from so many different, how do you make it all ha. talk to each other? Yes, what a, what a great question. So on the GPM team, which is the one I'm especially familiar with, we had a lot of work on this topic. So the first thing uh, in, in, um, in the, so when, when we say normalize, what we mean basically is that you have to have a reference that you really trust, right? You have to have something that you know is the closest to the truth as it can be, and then everything else sort of gets compared to that. And you can do absolute calibration, or you can do relative calibration. So in, first of all, we have uh, the GPM-4 satellite has a very, very well calibrated microwave radiometer that was absolutely calibrated. Okay, so first we knew that that was sort of as good as it could be. Then. I showed you how we paint all the other satellites with that. So we, we actually had a team that worked on cross-calibrating every other satellite to that one satellite that we trust. And that is the first step in producing that map. You can't do that map without that step. It is so important. So that is why it's, <laughs> you know, the, putting this information together requires a team of scientists working together to understand those errors, and then properly account for the discrepancies before we put it all together. Uh, and that's what makes it science quality data. So, you know, we, we at Goddard especially want to be the trusted source of data. So we take that responsibility very seriously. And we do not, you know, release products without going through a pretty rigorous calibration and validation process. And so that was a great question. Thanks. I think we have another question in the audience. Question. Sure. Thanks. Um, my name is William. I work for a commercial startup company here that uh, in the remote sensing industry, and uh, I'm excited to hear um, your talk today. But my question is um, really two parts as well, and one part is uh, really about the big data problem. So you mentioned that the data is really growing at a tremendous rate. And so maybe you could talk just a moment about how NASA is handling that with, in concert with NOAA and the other U.S. government and allied partners. And then secondly, um, with regard to commercial, you mentioned like Digital Globe, for example, and how there's a dearth of commercial data becoming available or already available in certain cases. And how, um, and, and kind of maybe you make a comment on what percentage would you say of the data that you're producing um, is actually derived from commercial data? Thank you so much. 
OK, great. So first of all, the big data question. Uh, so NASA is undergoing a transformation right now in our data systems and also to uh, the cloud. So step one is that we are moving all of NASA's data archives into the cloud. Right now, all of NASA's data is archived in distributed archive centers with on-premise computing, which is rapidly becoming unsustainable. Okay? So step one is it's all being migrated into the cloud. Step two is that all of the algorithms and the processing is also being made open source. So now it will be transparent, reproducible. Anyone can see exactly what we did and can build on it. So that's, you know, that's what's going to make it. It's going to democratize science, because then everyone has access to what we've done, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Once someone figures out how to read Grace data once, no one else should have to figure that out, right? All the grad students, you know, I mean, remember when you were a grad student? <laughs> if you were. <laughs> you know, like, how many hours did you spend figuring out how to read this data set? That, that should not happen in the future, first of all. So we've got collaboration hubs. All of that will be open source. Um, beyond that, there's also the, you know, it, the cost models are complicated. Uh, so we are working on the egress costs and, and making sure that that's covered because NASA data has always been open and free, and we want to keep it that way. So that is an important part of our open data strategy. Uh, but then the next step is how do you, uh, how do you enable processing of all these data? So the, you know, different cloud providers have, um, you know, different cost models, but I mean, ultimately, the computing ability is almost unbounded, you know, in, in the cloud. So that's so that the, it allows processing that we can't support, you know, in our supercomputing centers on premise. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, that, there's more to it than that, but I'll stop there <laughs> uh, for, for now. Um, all right, so the second question is um, commercial data and what fraction of the data that we're using today is commercial. So NASA embarked on a commercial data buy program several years ago, and we've sort of just been dabbling in it, to be honest. It, it is not, um, well, you know, we have a number of projects that are, that are using commercial data for science. I showed you just one, which is counting trees, which is really cool. Um, but we are essentially moving towards a model where um, we will be having a mix of commercial data acquisition and um, having um, you know, some of our core missions simultaneous with that. So thinking of the commercial world as part of this broader constellation. And so I think the way we're headed is is that we think of it as an ecosystem, you know, an, an Earth-observing ecosystem, where all of these are part of that ecosystem. And ultimately, the trick is how do you combine them? How do you do that calibration? How do you, how do you manage the data volumes and process? Um, those are the parts we haven't finished solving, but we're working on it. So, good Great. question. Um, another question from the online audience. Uh, Damien wants to know if there's any part of the EIS website that you would recommend that's especially good for use in high school science? Ooh, OK. Well, I would recommend the freshwater module first, because um, there are a lot of tools on the freshwater side. So you can actually go there. And we've done some pre we've, we've run the model. And you can actually, there's a visualization tool where you can actually visualize some of the things we ran and produce your own plots, which would be cool. And there's also a lot of. Um, there's more of those story maps that I mentioned um, on the water site. So you can um, navigate through some, uh, you know, I showed you the flooding example tonight, okay? But there's a drought example. There's a water quality example. So it's a really um, interesting way to look at the water cycle from different angles. So uh, anyway, yeah, I, that would be where I would go first. Um, I think we have time for another uh, in-audience question. Hello, doctor. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, two questions. Uh, the first question is regarding commercial products and data, like the tree counting example. Is there, does NASA do any validation of those products or data for, 
So I assume like the tree counting is maybe based on machine learning or AI. Uh, second question. Um, so I'm from the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands, and we use a lot of data from EU MedSat. And I was wondering if you comment on the relationship between NASA and the European. Thank you. Yes. So uh, yes. Machine learning was a key part of the tree counting. Uh, we had special training data that was collected for us. That was a key part of that project. And so um, I guess the, the, the lesson learned there is that these, these reference data sets, I mean, they're essential for machine learning. They're essential for learning about the Earth in general. But machine learning in particular requires good training data, right? Like, it's nothing without the training. So. Uh, so yes, that, that was a key part of that project. And they are currently working on expanding the area. But again, they're limited by the training data. So um, second question is about the collaboration with Europe. Um, so other than our direct collaborations we, you know, with, on, on the satellites themselves, so we do have collaborations with ESA, S. Um, DLR is a collaborator on uh, the GRACE satellites, for example. Um, so other than that, there's also collaboration on the um, processing in the cloud side. So the, the basically the earth the back end of the earth information system relies on a cloud-based platform with um, open source support. And we have a special collaboration uh, hub that we stood up with ESA called MAP, um, and we have a test case that we've done there to estimate biomass. Um, and we're working on expanding EIS into the ESA collaboration hub. So we are working on that actively right now. It's not ready to show yet, but uh, we're working on it. So that's very important, all of our partners. Well, thanks, everybody, for your questions. We're out of time this evening. But uh, I want to thank our speaker again. Thank you, Dr. Peters Ladard, for a a wonderful talk, and thank you to our in-person audience and also to our uh, online audience. Everyone, you know, give yourselves and the speaker a hand, please. And um, thank you. And thank you again to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance, for their support. Um, and uh, please join us again on April 20th for another in-person and live-streamed event, which will be uh, a talk by Timothy Murtha about doing archaeology. Uh, and tonight, you, you can go outside if you want to stay around for a little while longer and observe the skies with some of our astronomy educators. Thank oh, cool. you, and good night. Okay, thank you.